Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a challenging one on stewardship, motives of the heart. This is lesson number 10 in that series for March 10 of 2018, entitled, The Role of Stewardship. Hmm, wonder what that's going to be about. Well, we'll find out after we pray together. Please join us as we ask God to guide us in our study. Our kind and wonderful Father, we now ask your guidance, your protection as we move through these ideas. May we clearly uh, present what's here that to share with others so that each one may be benefited is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. We've already covered quite a few different aspects of stewardship. It's a big subject. Every true Christian, we are beginning to understand, must be a true or careful steward. And I think, Carrie, you know, you have something to say about that. It is not a theory nor a philosophy, but a working program. It is in verity the Christian law of living. It is necessary to an adequate understanding of life and essential to a true, vital religious experience. It is not simply a matter of mental ass assent, but it is an act of the will and a definite, decisive transaction touching the whole perimeter of life. It comes from Leroy E. Froome's Stewardship in its Larger Aspects. Okay. So, our question for this week is, what does it mean, what does it actually mean to be a Christian steward? Is Christian stewardship really central to our idea of Christianity? Our Bible study guide suggests that stewardship may be likened to a chariot wheel. That's interesting. We'll see how that works out. Surely every Christian who is a careful student of Scripture will recognize that Christ is the center of all of Scripture. He was the God of the Old Testament. How do you know that? Jesus said so. Jesus said so. John 5, 39 and 40, Luke 24, 44, and 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. Of course, he's also the central figure in the New Testament. That should be more obvious. And he will be the future king and leader of God's kingdom forever. Even Satan will bow down and recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. How do we know that, Gary? Philippians 2, 9 through 11. For this reason God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so the honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the, to the glory of, the, of God the Father. We're not going to let you off until you finish it up there. <laughs> to the glory of God okay. the Father. Okay, so does that mean, does it mean, here's my question, does that mean that Satan himself will one day bow down and admit that God was right? Yes. Yes. So what it seems to say, I mean, everybody above, the heavens above, the earth below, the and the, this un, what's under the earth, that's, that was the Hebrew term for, for the grave. So, I mean, where else can you go? Well, Ellen White concurred, writing, Jesus is the living center of everything. Evangelism, page 186. So, does that mean that Satan is going to be converted? Or is he going to bow down and then continue in his rebellion? Okay, now, that's a very good question. Uh, why would he bow down? What happens? What's the sequence? Do you remember? This is overwhelming. Yeah. Just before he bows down, God is going to put that panorama in the sky that's going to tell the story of salvation from the beginning of Satan's rebellion in heaven to that very point. And everybody's going to see the part they have played in that. And I mean, it's going to make Steven Spielberg turn green. This is going to be living 3D color. And it's going to be so obvious to everyone, including Satan himself, that they're, you just... I mean, there's not going to be physical force, but just the 
compulsion is, oh man, look what I've done. And Satan is going to be down on his knees. Now that doesn't mean he's converted, no. Because he's going to jump up and say, let's attack the city. And what's the response going to be? You are the one who got us into this mess. You know, they're going to turn to attack him. Well, there's verses in, in the writings of Paul, for example, Galatians 2.20, that say, So that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. This life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So, I mean, Paul surely felt that Christ was the center of his life. Well, there's some interesting verses, Colossians 1, 16 through 20, and Romans 8, 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that basically tell us that Christ is not only the creator of all things, but that he will one day set us free from slavery to decay, and that he will make us new creatures by turning uh, those who accept him into his friends. He did this by coming and sharing our human condition so that we could share his future. So that's a pretty awesome accomplishment that he's done there and um, he, he, he recognized that he didn't go around bragging but he just said to his disciples on the last night he was with them before crucifixion I'm the vine you are the branches those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit for you can do nothing without me does that mean you can't breathe you can't your heart can't beat what does that mean nothing without me Exactly that. It's only because of God's power that we breathe and keep our heart beating. Well, what was Jesus' financial conditions while he was here on this earth? Poor. Oh, yeah. We know that his parents gave two turtle doves, apparently, for his, the sacrifice for him in, at, at the temple when he was dedicated. So they, they were recognized their poverty. In the time he was traveling around, what did he have? Do we have evidence that he ever paid tithe or, or gave any offerings? The temple tax. The temple tax, that time when Peter said, oh yeah, sure, of course. That was, of course, a, 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 a trap. They, they, were they were trying to trap Jesus into admitting that he wasn't really a prophet. And it backfired on them, as usual. <laughs> yeah. Peter got that coin out of the mouth of the fish and he said well I'll pay I'll pay for my my tax and Jesus's tax well our Bible study guide then turns to talking about the sanctuary in the Old Testament I don't know about the rest of you but I find that this series of lessons seem to jump from here to there and you, at first you think what in the world are they talking about and then you see stewardship involves a lot of things doesn't it have you ever thought of the sanctuary in the context of stewardship? Well, we Adventists have been famous, among scholars at least, for two things. Our interpretation of prophecy, particularly the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, but also how those relate to the sanctuary system and all that was involved in the Old Testament. We believe now that we are in the antitypical Day of Atonement. That's a big, long expression. What does that mean? We're at the end. We're at the, the last days. Remember, that at the very end of the Jewish religious year, they had that time when they had to clean up everything. They had to get yeast out of their houses. They had to uh, cleanse themselves. They had to clean everything up. And they had to get their, you know, ask forgiveness for their sins so that when they're ready to start the new year, everything was supposed to be taken care of. So we're in that time. So um, our, our interpretation of Daniel 8 and 9 in connection with our understanding of the Jewish sacred year has led to our interpretation of prophecies and some important predictions about where we are in human history. It is absolutely, absolutely essential that we understand, one, why Jesus had to die, two, what he is doing now in the heavenly sanctuary, and three, whether we want to be faithful Seventh-day Adventists, because that might be the implications of that. And Dennis, I think you have the next quote there.
Yes, and this is quoted in the Advent, uh, Adult Bible School, Bible Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Uh, standing on the sola scriptura, scripture alone principle, biblical Adventism builds its doctrinal doctrinal system from the general perspective of the sanctuary uh, doctrine. Uh, and that's from uh, Fernando Canale, Secular Adventism, question mark, exploring the link between lifestyle and salvation. Okay. Uh, we, we're not, we're getting, we're getting input from, in our Bible study, our Bible study guides now from other parts of the world, which we haven't been quite so used to getting in the past. Well, so in order to understand our doctrine about the heavenly sanctuary and what happens there, it is essential. I'm going to emphasize this. Now, it is essential that we read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. This is not in the usual Bible study guide. I want to take us there and I want you to read this. In another version, I will read it here. In another vision, the Lord showed me, this is in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua. Now, what was the usual work of the high priest? Intercede and to do the Day of Atonement, to do the but work on the Day of Atonement. Exactly, and he's supposed to represent all the people, right? Mm -hmm. He showed me high, high, the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. So who's doing the accusing? Satan. Satan. What, who, what is Satan called in Revelation 14? I'm, I'm sorry, Revelation 12? You remember? Accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren, right. So here we have it. Both Old and New Testament. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, now the angel of the Lord here, many re look at that and they say, angel is a, he, an old word that means messenger. And he's talking about the angel of the Lord. Probably he's talking about Jesus himself said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. What do the filthy clothes represent? Unrighteousness. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. So what do we find here? He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Now, that's important because what does it tell us? Who's doing the accusing? Satan. For those of you who are familiar with the writings of Ellen White, I would really encourage you before you take on this lesson to read the chapter in Great Controversy entitled, if you have one of the older editions, the Investigative Judgment it was called, and the more recent editions is called Facing Life's Record. That's a very important chapter that will explain all this. And there's a parallel chapter in Prophets and Kings entitled Joshua and the Angel, talking specifically about this passage there in Zechariah 3. Very, very important to understand because if you don't, it's very easy to misinterpret passages like 1 John 2, 1. I'm writing this to you, my children, so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So how does that, what does that sound like? Sounds like we have to convince the Father. It does. It sounds like Jesus is pleading to convince the Father to do something. That's a false interpretation. When it says this with in that expression, someone who pleads with the Father, the Greek word just means in front of. In front of the Father. And who's standing here doing the accusing? The adversary. The adversary. So in front of God, who's standing there? Satan to accuse us and Jesus to defend us. So if we have that picture very clearly in mind, yes, Dennis. Isn't it uh, the word paraclete? Uh, yeah. That, that comes from, and, and does that not mean helper? Yeah, exactly, yeah. That, that One who Jesus stands beside is someone, yeah. our helper. Yeah, and that, that expression is used to refer to the Holy Spirit. It's also used to refer to Jesus in the Bible. And the accuser is also accusing God. Mm -hmm. or has, uh, that the, big, the grand scheme is he's accused God of, 
of uh, bad character. Yeah. So we need to ask questions like this. Who is accusing us? Now, can we all say it together? Satan. Satan, Satan is the one who's accusing. Let's be very clear about that. It's also described as a deceiver in yeah. Revelation 12, 9. Yeah. And two, who's representing us before the throne of God? Jesus. That's Jesus. It is Satan who accuses us. It is Jesus who defends us. And God the Father also loves us. And I'm going to read two passages, one very familiar one, John 3, 16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. So who's it talking about who loves the world so much? The Father. Has to be the Father, because he gives the Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. And then we need to turn to John 16, 25 and 26. Jesus, again, talking to his disciples the last night he's with them before he goes, he goes out and is arrested and accused and all those other things. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, if you had everything in Scripture and you wanted to find what was most important, if you knew that Jesus himself said, let me tell you plainly about the Father, wouldn't that be somewhere like number one? I would have thought so, right? And what did he say? When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say, is that word in it? Not. Look at that. I do not say that it will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. So, Jesus is not pleading, trying to convince the Father to love us. And you go a little bit farther, then the, yeah. the disciple says, oh, now you're talking plainly and not at any figures of speech. You're yeah. just talking plainly about the Father. We but, must never allow anyone to suggest that the Father is the one accusing us. Does the Father ever accuse? No. No. I, why do you say that? Because because that's what's usually the thought. definition of the of the word accuse could mean I have something against you. Yeah. yeah. Well, he says that to some of the churches in Revelation. I well, have something against you. And but who? Yeah, he, he always had something against uh, the Israelis you, too. You forgot to read chapter one before you read chapters two and three because who is it the one that's doing that? It's Jesus, not that's the accusing? Father. Huh? This, if you're going to call that accusing, the one who does it in chapter 1 is clearly Jesus and not the Father. So Jesus isn't the Father? Well, of course, that's a, we can go round and round on that question <laughs> about... Well, I'm but, just, I'm just but, saying But in that. terms of Revelation, if, you, if you're going to read the, the book itself, chapter 1 presents Jesus, and then he goes on to speak to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. So I want to read three... I'm going I'm to ask us to, to look at three passages... And I think, Gordon, you've got those, John 3, John 5, and John 12? Yes, John 3, 17 to 21. Now, I'm going to take, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. John is the ultimate conclusion to the gospel stories. It was written a long time after the other gospels were written, and it's written specifically, primarily about experiences that Jesus had while in Jerusalem. So, here he is speaking to the Jewish leaders in, or in various ways and trying to say the, as clear as he can what's really important, okay? And saying who the judge is. Yeah. So, for God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only son. This is how the judgment works. Now, that ought to be a clear de experience, right? This should be a clear definition. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their de evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Okay, now let's stop there for a second. <coughs> What's the basis of judgment based on what, on Jesus' own words here? 
Response to the light. Response to the light. We are judged by the truth. Light, truth, and don't those go together? So it's how we respond to the truth. Okay, Gordon? Another one from John 5, 22. Nor does the Father himself judge anyone. He has given his Son the full right to judge. Whoa, now we got a real problem. The Father's not judging? The Son is not judging? Well, that's what Jesus seems to say. Go ahead. And John 12, 47 to 48. If anyone hears my message and does not obey it, I will not judge him. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. Whoa! Who's the judge? The words Jesus has spoken. The, the words I have spoken the truth. truth will it's be. how you respond to the truth. But also it says that truth will set you free. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah. Exactly. So your relationship to the truth, which is another way of saying your relationship to God, because God is truth, isn't it? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, truth and the life. Okay? So our relationship to God is what saves us. The core message of Seventh-day Adventism, I am absolutely convinced from my experiences with reading Ellen White, as presented in Scripture and spelled out by Ellen White, and Scripture just says the same thing, is the truth about God, His character, and His government. All other doctrines find their meaning as they help us to understand God's character. So now, we've been talking about stewardship. Stewardship, of course, reflects what we really believe about the plan of salvation and about our responsibilities to God. Right? Well, look at this passage, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weakness, weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who, has, who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help, uh, help us just when we need it. Okay, what does that say to us? What's the purpose of that passage? Point us to heavenly things. What's okay. Transpiring in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay. It's also clearly to say that God came, Jesus came down to associate himself with us. So he, he anything we think we have been through, he's, he's been there before. Surely the devil made his temptations as fierce as possible. Do you think, well, th let, let me read you this next paragraph, and I, I want you to tell me whether you, this makes sense to you or not. When Jesus came to this earth and was born as a baby boy, the devil was certain that he would be able to get him to sin. Why did he think that? Everyone else had sinned. Everyone else from Adam to Jesus was a sinner. So he said, this baby boy, of course I'll get him to sin. That was Satan's first goal. More than 30 years later, as Jesus was in his ministry, the devil, having failed to get him to sin in any way so far, began to take a second approach. He thought, well, if he could not get Jesus to sin, he would try to make his life so difficult that he would, that he would give up and go back to heaven without actually sinning. Now, he doesn't have to commit some sin here on this earth. Just have him give up on this plan and go back to heaven, which would really be a kind of sinning, but go back. That's what, so Satan said, let me make his life as difficult as possible. So he tried that. When that failed and Jesus' life ended with his death on the cross, the devil and all his angels did what they could to keep him in the grave. Remember that Satan claims everyone who is dead is being his rightful domain. But as we know, Jesus arose in his own power and came forth from the grave there was nothing Satan or any of his angels could do about it. <coughs> and I would really encourage, if you have a few minutes, go to Desire of Ages, page 785, read a few paragraphs before and a few paragraphs after that to see um, exactly what's going on there. Okay, who we got? Who's? 
Yeah, Myra. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. Those who study the Redeemer's wonderful sacrifice grow in grace and knowledge. Ellen G. White comments from the uh, uh, SDA Bible Commentary. Volume 5, 1137. Okay. Well, we've read those passages. Gordon just read to us those, some of those passages from John saying that we'll be judged by the truth. Thus, it is essential that we recognize that Jesus was the truth and that he wants nothing more from us than to live according to that truth. Here's another bit of information that I've added to the lesson here. Research into why people join churches and whether or not they stay has demonstrated that a person must one of, has to have two, about, two out, of, out of three things if they decide to stay with the church. Uh, they must live according to at least two of these three basic principles if they're going to remain faithful. One, they must believe the teachings and doctrines of the church. So if you don't believe them, you're sooner or later probably going to leave. Two, they should become involved in one way or another in the church's activities, participating on a regular basis. If you're a deacon, if you have some other responsibility and you feel like you're a part of it, that makes you much more likely to stay. And three, you must feel that, he's, that that person is a regular member of a relatively small group of Christian friends who will miss him if he's not there. So if he, he needs to feel a part of that group. And those are the things that make people stay. Okay? Anybody want to argue with those points? Questions about it? I'm throwing in some extra pieces here. For the typical person of the world who becomes a Christian, this involves a fairly radical change. Okay, Jim, I think you've got Ephesians 4 there. Ephesians 4, 20 to 24. That was not what you learnt about Christ. You certainly heard about him, and as his followers you were taught the truth that is in Jesus. So rid yourselves so rid of your old self which made you live as you used to, the old self that was being destroyed by its deceitful desires. Your hearts and minds must be made completely new, and you must put on the new self which is created in God's likeness and reveals itself in the truth life that is upright and holy from the Good News Bible translation. So that's a pretty significant change, isn't it? Completely give up the old, completely accept the new. Well, and that's the yeah, desire is to be in a state of atonement. I let, I, whenever I see that word atonement, pronounced atonement, it's a mistranslation or misinterpretation of what Tyndale was, was trying to convey, and that is... From the original to, language. Yeah, at, at one minute. When everybody is in harmony, mm -hmm. or those that choose to be in harmony with, with God, that's at one minute. Mm -hmm. It's not a payment or a penalty and so forth, as, which is traditional theology, which mm -hmm. is messed up. Well, careful Bible students will recognize that there have only been two times in history of our world when God warned of a coming catastrophe. When are those two times? Time of Noah was the first. The days of Noah, of course, the Noah, Noah's flood, uh, Genesis 6, 13 to 18, and Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24, 37. When's the other time? Yet to come, but it's close. That's us. Yes. We're in it, okay? The three angels' messages recorded in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. The third angel's message particularly is the most fearsome language in the entire Bible. Now, why would God be talking like that after talking about chapters and chapters, even by the same author, about how God is love and kindness and all that? Why would he use this kind of language? As a final desperate attempt to get our attention, he raises his voice. As wow. Graham Maxwell said, gave the illustration of the teacher who yeah. was soft-spoken and got up on the chair when there was a fire and all the kids were yelling and screaming and not paying attention to her to get out. She threw an eraser mm -hmm. to get their attention, stood yeah. up on the chair, yelled, 
This is God yelling and throwing an eraser. Yeah, to say, please listen to what I have to say. So, we as Seventh-day Adventists have claimed to have a correct understanding of the three angels' messages. More than that, we have stated that our mission to the world is to explain those messages clearly to those with whom we come in contact. Are we doing that? Do I need to ask again? <laughs> Probably not to the extent we should be. I would bet that there are very few Seventh-day Adventists. We, we can do pretty well with, with the first angel's message. We can usually do pretty well with the second angel's message. But when we get to the third angel's message, most of us are... We either get it completely wrong or we don't know what to say. So the first angel's message tells us what? That the hour of God's <coughs> judgment has come. And so the big question about that message is, is that the time when God is to be judged, or is that the time when we are to be judged, or both? Both. Both. Why do you say both? Safer. Well, no. We're, <laughs> Safer. It's true. God, God is, you could say that God is on trial in how he handles the judgment. Mm -hmm. And where is that found in the Bible? More specifically than right here? Do you remember? Well, Romans, Daniel 7. Romans 3, 4 is really Daniel good. 7 talks about the judgment, but the real place is Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 4. You've got to be it, careful what translation you use. Yeah. It talks yeah. about God being, being, you know, taking his case into court. Well, then there's a second angel reminds us that Babylon has fallen. In light of a fuller understanding of the books of Daniel Revelation, it is clear that this is talking about apostate Christianity. And where do we find apostate Christianity? And the answer is everywhere. <laughs> but especially in this case, uh, if you look at historically, we're talking about the Roman Catholic system, but that system is spreading. A lot of other people are basically believing the same system. Well, in the third angel's message, we come across the most fearsome warning in the entire Bible. We need to be able to explain clearly what is meant by the mark of the beast, the wine of God's fury, God's wrath, what the, that fire is that will consume the wicked at the end. If we cannot explain these things in biblical terms, we have not lived up to our mission. So, Dennis? In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. This is from uh, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9, uh, page 45. No, page 19, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Le la last Day Events, page 45. <clears throat> okay, so um, you out there, how many people in the church where you go can clearly explain the third angel's message without misrepresenting God. You who are here, what percentage of Adventists do you think can clearly explain the third angel's message in a way that does not misrepresent God? Probably not very many. Yeah. Should we ask how many people? Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you count on one hand? No. Yeah. Well, this, this is a very important subject, and mm -hmm. I don't want to take off. Uh, You're right. On a, on well, you just read it. I mean, yes, uh, but we have a heritage that that we don't don't acknowledge or recognize. Um, you go back to the translators uh, of the of the King James Bible, yeah. you know, 1611. So, what was their paradigm? Mm -hmm. And uh, it affects how things get translated. We, we just talked about the advocate, uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have been given a, a legal representation mm -hmm. uh, of, of that idea. Um, and that was, that's because I believe that the translators in the church at that time uh, held, felt that, understood that God was the enemy of man. Yeah. And if you, you read uh, John Stott, uh, and he takes the position and creates the argument that, that God needs to be reconciled to us. Mm -hmm. And he, even, even though he, he very succinctly and precisely states that, no place in the Bible does it suggest, does it say that God needs to be reconciled to us, but that doesn't stop him from introducing his theology. And then he quotes um, uh, a Swiss uh, theologian. Uh, Karl Barth? No. Which one? Um, not, not I'm trying to say it, I can't come up with it. Um, okay. That, that reconciliation, real reconciliation, um, and he continues, insists, uh, assumes that there is hostility, that they're on both sides, and, and then concludes, and this is, this is how Stott, uh, you know, puts the, the nail in his argument, that man is the enemy of God, and God is the enemy of man. Both false. And, uh, and um, wh wh where else have you read that? Well, it comes from the Bible. Yeah. It's in Genesis 3. It's a conversation with the serpent uh, at, at the tree that God has lied. He's not uh, acting in your favor. It's uh, not from God's word. I mean, well, God's not the one saying it. But it's it. in the Bible. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in the Bible. Yeah. So I think, I, I mean, I, I think it's important to recognize that the Christian paradigm is entirely different than what we're trying to explain here. That there's a history where these ideas, these false ideas, have been introduced into our theology and we don't even recognize that these false teachers have hoodwinked us. Yeah. Well, you've got the same problem with uh, the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job's right here. And it was eighty percent of it is lies, eh? and yeah. you don't find that out until you get to the last chapter. Yeah, that that it, that, that that's the case. And we can go through. By past that you mean Job's friends are the liars? Yes, yes, absolutely. Forgive it. Yeah, we, that needs to be clarified. And right up the bit get go, I have yet to find a uh, Bible commentary that really understands the Book of Job. Mm -hmm. Most of them have, Job's got all these problems. No, God declares Job righteous right from the get-go, the mm -hmm. first two chapters. Yeah. So this is what we've got as a problem of Bible translation. Yeah. Uh, we find once in Ezekiel one thing, and you go to Jeremiah three times, it just says just the opposite of what is said in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Deuteronomy 30, or th what, Deuteronomy 18, he says don't do these things. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need yeah. to teach people how to, as best we can, read the Bible. encourage them to, to study the Bible. We need to point out some of these uh, problems. You know, I, I wouldn't go so far to say that Joe's friends were all, everything they said was lies. Well, it just, was deceptive. I know, but, but still, um, the to, word, to guard from deception, you've got to understand that, that the devil uses the truth mixed that, with lies. That's right, right. yeah, that's and, the point. And that's, that's important that People will understand that. But okay. we end up with, with a couple of the lies from Eliphaz, as stated in, in the, in the uh, Bible, uh, Bible study guide, as if it was true. Yeah. If they've done that, they, they did that 25 years ago or thereabouts, and they did this uh, within the last year. Yes. According as if it was true, the words of Eliphaz. Well, way back at the beginning of our lesson, we talked about how this lesson is going to have stewardship as a, something about a wheel. So here's the, here's the basis for that. The Romans discovered that a chariot wheel lasted longer if a band of iron was placed around the rim. Mm -hmm. The craftsman heated the metal to expand it just enough to slip it over the, the wooden hub, basically the wooden uh, 
whatever frame. you call it. Spokes. The spokes and so forth, the whole. But what do you call that? Wooden, the rim, I guess, yeah. Wooden rim. Cold water shrank it to a tight fit. The band of iron then made contact with the road as the wheel turned. The iron band on the rim can represent the concept of stewardship. This is the moment of truth where our spiritual lives rub against our practical lives. It is where our faith meets the ups and downs of life through successes and failures. It is where our beliefs get real in the rough and tumble scuffles of daily li living. Stewardship is the outer wrapping of what, who we are and what we do. It is a witness of our conduct and of our life well managed. Our daily actions that reveal Christ are like the iron on the wheel that touches the road. And that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide or no, yeah, uh, for Thursday, March, March 8. Well, do we really believe that we can do all things through Christ as he strengthens us, as Paul says? And Carrie, I guess that's yours. The sanctification of the soul by the working of the Holy Spirit is the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity. Gospel religion is Christ in the life, a living, active principle. It is the grace of Christ revealed in character and wrought out in good works. The principles of the gospel cannot be disconnected from any department of practical life. Every line of Christian experience and labor is to be a representation of the life of Christ. It comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 384, paragraph 1. So what we're seeing here is that theology and Christianity and reading of the Bible and understanding the Bible is not just something that deals with the future life, but it deals very much with what we do, how we live right now. So, now the question. You out there. Do the people in your town or city recognize that Seventh-day Adventists are representing the truth about Jesus Christ? Or are we? Are we? There were times when the iron bands on the chariot wheels of the Romans came off or needed to be reset. That was a very difficult process. In the same way, Christians may have to go through some very difficult times to separate us from the evils that we have grown accustomed to and bring us back into line with God's plan for us. Think of an example. Peter. What happened to Peter near the end of the ministry of Jesus? There they are in the upper room and Jesus starts talking about how they're all going to abandon him. And what did Peter say? Not I. No, not me, Lord. I'll go with you even if I have to die. Right? And a few hours later, what's he saying? Didn't know Denied who he was. I don't even know who this man is. Then didn't he curse to, to, uh, yeah. for emphasis? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> well, sometime later he went down to Joppa and then he was called to Cornelius' house and he went through that whole experience in Acts 10 and 11. There he is in a, in, in, in a Gentile's house, a Roman no less, and he sees the, the Spirit of God, the latter rain or the former rain poured out upon these Gentiles. And I don't know how it would affect one of you, but I think that if I saw that, that would be a pretty convincing argument, don't you think? And yet what happened? We find him a little while later up there in Antioch and here come some people from Jerusalem saying, you know, we need to be careful in this association with Gentiles. And Peter says, well, not me. Associated with Gentiles? Mm, not me. And what did Paul do? <laughs> called him out. He called him out, just openly and in public, didn't he? Well, there are some interesting passages in Scripture, and I really, I'm looking forward to the day when I, we can see this as it really happened and understand what's going on here. What did the disciples think Jesus was talking about in his life when he said, you must take up your cross? Did they say, huh? What's he talking about? They had no, the, not the remotest clue that he would one day die on a cross. Well, here's, do, you, do you think that he didn't explain it to them a little bit more than what we have? And why, why wouldn't they explain it to us? Why wouldn't the writers explain it yeah. to us if, 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 he, if he really explained it to them? 
He never even told us why, what the purpose of his death was going to accomplish. Huh? And yet we get it all from a f the false presuppositions, the false theological spectacles that, that we approach the rest of the Bible. The assumption is God's got all this power and look out. And we, we, basically the, the lies of the adversary, Satan, has uh, colored our theology. Yeah. Well, here's one of those places where Jesus talks about the cross, Luke 9, 23. And he said to them all, anyone who wants to come with me must forget self, take up their cross every day and follow me. Now, before, this is way before Jesus is crucified. What in the world did they think he was talking about? Now, a long time later in Galatians, Paul wrote, as for me, however, I will boast only about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for by means of his cross the world is dead to me, and I am dead to the world. Now, what did the, what did the Romans and the Corinthians and the, 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 the Greeks and so forth, what did they think about the cross? The cross is a place where a traitor is, is, is killed, Right? I mean, this is, this is the, like the electric chair or the gas chamber or something like that. It's the worst thing you could do to somebody. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.16. As the scripture says, who knows the mind of the Lord? Who's able to give him advice? We, however, have the mind of Christ. And Paul is talking about thinking in very different kinds of ways. So what, in what way are we to take up the cross? I don't see anybody carrying a cross. Did any of you bring your crosses tonight? Well, we consider ourselves, reckon ourselves as dead, Paul yeah. says in uh, Romans 6. So we, uh, we seek to be insensitive to the promptings of the, the world. Well, that's why a dead person has no awareness or feeling for the things uh, about it. Yeah. And so if we uh, can... Uh, not that those things aren't there or that we could, but Paul says to consider ourselves. So it's like if you're trying to read something and everybody's talking, you try to shut it out so that you can concentrate. And it's a bit like that, where the world is clamoring for your attention. Uh, you're, you could be diverted to that, but that's not your intent. You're looking at the things of God, the things that are eternal in the heavens. So what would it mean to have the mind of Christ? Think like him. In terms of stewardship? Well, to seek to, to do the will of the Father because that's what mm -hmm. he was doing. He sought to say nothing except what the Father gave him to say okay. and to do nothing what, except what the Father gave him to do. So our attention needs to be this, in the same sense. <coughs> seeking to do the will of the Father. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you a challenge out there. Try to explain to someone who is not a Seventh day Adventist and doesn't already know this about the third angel's message. Let's see how well you do. Isn't shouldn't that be an important part of our practical Christianity? Do you have a clear picture of what the ancient sanctuary sanctuary was like? All the different parts of the, the equipment that was there, the accessories and so forth of the thing, the bronze altar, uh, the laver, the golden lamp, lamp stand, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. What, what do those things supposed to represent? Um, do you understand what each of those articles is supposed to represent? Well, in her chapter on facing life's records, or in older editions of Investigative Judgment we've already mentioned, Ellen White wrote some very <clears throat> startling words for us. And I think, Gary, is that you? Yes. All who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens the view of the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time 
and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is the most important importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asks them a reason of their hope that is in them. That's Ellen G. White, uh, Great Controversy, 488 to 489. Okay. And Dennis, I think we gave you the next one. Right, which is on uh, uh, four, uh, 489, the next paragraph. The intercession of Christ on man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death he began that work which, after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne, and through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith may be presented before God. So we have a, 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 what I suggested earlier. We need to understand two things. We need to understand why Jesus had to die. We need to understand what he's doing now in the heavenly sanctuary. And it's absolutely essential that we don't misrepresent that. We know who is the judge. We know who is speaking on our behalf and who is the accuser. Let's be very clear about that. It and says that the intercession of Christ yeah. is important. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is that saying? Well, Satan is accusing us. Jesus is speaking on our behalf. And what's the evidence? The evidence is our record. I mean, there's a complete and accurate record of our lives there. So the intersection of Christ is, is whatever he can say about us that's true. He's not going to lie about us. It's a, whatever he can say about us that's true. That's the intercess intercession of Christ, yeah. That's the person in between, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't, when you talk oh. about that, aren't you talking about Christ as being the, the view of God, that he is the one that you're looking at to know what God is? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I, yeah, and that's, that's at a different stage. In terms of the judgment, What's happening is Satan looks at our lives. He has an accurate record, Ellen White says, of everything, every sin we've ever committed. And he's, he starts out through that list. And he says, you're going to save this person who's, and I'll point to myself, you're going to save this person who's done all these sins? And what's Jesus going to respond? He's going to say, hopefully, those sins no longer just describe this person. He's, now he's different. Da-da-da-da-da. And that's, that's his intercession. Gordon, I think you have the next paragraph. Page uh, 422 from Great Controversy. There must be an examination of the books of record to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. The cleansing of the sanctuary therefore involves a work of investigation, a work of judgment, this work must be performed prior to the coming of Christ to redeem his people. For when he comes, his reward is with him to give to every man according to his works. Revelation 22:12, and again from Great Controversy. Yeah. Clearly, God must make decisions based on the records of our lives and the general direction in which we are headed before he can come to take some to heaven and allow the rest to die awaiting the third coming. This judgment that will take place before Christ's second coming is spoken of in Revelation, in Daniel, and in Matthew. If we had time, we would, we would look at those passages. The coming of Christ spoken of in Revelation is symbolized elsewhere in the Bible by marriage. And the symbol of a marriage supper or a feast prior to the marriage itself is, up, um, is used in Scripture to describe the investigative judgment before, before the second coming. And we have there, Myra, I guess you're next. Yes. The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8:14, is represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. Great Controversy, page 426. 
Okay. <coughs> so, going on, what do we have next there, Jim? In the parable of Matthew 22, the same figure of the marriage is introduced, and the investigative judgment is clearly represented as taking place before the marriage. Previous to the wedding, the king comes to see the guests, to see if all are attired in the wedding garment. Now, to make this clear, some people have, and I've misunderstood this, so I, let me speak from my past experience. What happened in those old times is that the, the king provided the wedding garments. So it wasn't whether you couldn't afford a garment, you, you were provided with the garments. Okay, go ahead. The spotless robe of character washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb, Matthew 22, 11, Revelation 7, 14. He who is found wanting is cast out, but all who upon examination are seen to have the wedding garment on are accepted of God and accounted worthy of a share in his kingdom and a seat upon his throne. This work of examination of character, of determining who are prepared for the kingdom of God, is that of the investigative judgment, the closing work in the sanctuary above. We're running out of time, so Dennis, I guess, maybe you could just read the, the bold type there in that last passage. God has made us the depositaries of his holy word. What have we done with the light and truth given to us to make men wise unto salvation? No value is attached to a mere profession of faith in Christ. Only the love which is shown by works is counted genuine. Yet it is love alone which in the sight of heaven makes any act of value. Whatever is done from love, however small it may appear in the estimation of men, is accepted and rewarded of God. If we had time, we would read Matthew 24, 14, which is not conditional. It's a clear prophecy of God. The end will come. The gospel will be preached to the whole world. And the question which is left for us is, are we going to be a part of that? Are we going to leave that job to the generation after us? Would you like to see Jesus come in your lifetime? I would. And that's our choice. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege we have of living this close to the second coming. May we make the most of this opportunity as we are faithful to you and are faithful in our representation of you to others around us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.